I was born down in uh, Red River County, that's southeast of the uh, Dallas area, and uh, raised there until in my teens. And then uh, my folks moved around quite a bit. We moved out to West Texas area, stayed two or three years, and then back to Red River County. It was in 1940. I signed up in 1939 after I got out of school. I missed the last year of my school in 37, 38. Uh, when I turned 17, I joined the Civilian Conservation Corps that Roosevelt had started, and I spent a year out in New Mexico in that, and then I came back, and uh, that was in 37, and I came back in 39, and uh, signed up for the Navy, or put my name in. At that time, they was having trouble getting enough uh, recruits to hold, uh, for a company to send through training, so I had to wait a while, and uh, uh, I, went, I eventually went to work for the federal government as an auditor, auditing accounts for them, and, uh, and then I saw an ad for the, by the Dallas Police Department for police officers, and I went down and signed up and took their examination. And, uh, fortunately, I think I passed out of the 15 or 20 or so that took the test, and I think I ended up being number two or three on it, so I felt good about that. And, and I went to work in 1950 with the Dallas Police Department with the Homicide Division. They was, we had a lot of different things happen, but in 1963, when the President Kennedy came for a visit, why, he was assassinated. And uh, one of the things that happened after the after his assassination was Oswald, who had shot the President, and made his way to Oak Cliff and. He was stopped on the street because he's walking along in a pretty fast clip. And uh, from J.D. Tippett stopped him and questioned him. Uh, something that back in my years earlier, I'd done it many, many times. You'd stop somebody because you're looking for someone. And they had given him a general description of what Oswald looked like from the, heads, from the people that saw him in the window when the shots were fired. So he stopped and just merely that questioned him about his name and so forth. But uh, I had four good witnesses. Uh, a witness to the shooting of uh, Tippett, and uh, all of them gave the, about the same description that they said that when Tippett pulled up on the side of the street there and called Oswald over, and he was driving along about 10 miles an hour. Actually, that wasn't his beat because they took the man out of, called the man out on that beat and worked downtown, and they called Tippett in from the outlying area to cover that particular area. So he just pulled him over, and I'd done the same thing many times. I'd look for somebody, and if I see somebody walking along the street that resembled him, I would stop them and talk to them. And of course, 99 times out of 100, you sent them on the way because they wouldn't know who you're looking for. That's what would have happened with uh, with uh, Tippett had uh, Oswald been able to think long enough uh, about it because uh, Tippett had called him over to the car door and uh, he leaned in and talked to him, they said, for a few seconds. And then Tippett got out and started walking around the front of the car to get to him. And Oswald stepped back two or three feet. And when Tippett got to the left front fender of the car, uh, Oswald pulled out his pistol and went into that marine stance that he'd been taught and just bang, 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 bang four times, just like that. He didn't move his gun up and down, he had left it steady. And so the first shot that hit uh, Tippett was down, was low along the belt area, and the next one was a little higher. And what, uh, what, what caused him, what he did is he let he went forward with the first shot and he started turning to his left and another, the bullet went walked on up his body as he fell and the last one uh, when he was going down he fell on his left side and as he went down on the left uh, on there his head passed the line of view line of shot and the bullet hit him uh, in the temple and come out the top now we have a lot of a lot of conspiracy people uh, saying that Oswald walked around the car, back of the car, very nonchalant like, and shot him in the temple because of that, of that direction of the bullet. Well, I served as a tech technical advisor for Oliver Stone when he made the Jake FK movie. And he come to that, we had a little discussion about it. He wanted to write that uh, Oswald, some idiot had said that they, Oswald just casually walked around the car and shot him in the head because that's the only way they'd had that bullet going at an angle through his head. But I told Stone, I said, that ain't the way it happened. And, and so 
I said, if uh, when I asked, because when, when Oswald finished up, he turned to run. He run by the porch where the Davis sisters were sta standing and kicked the empty holes out of his gun. And they passed the cab driver over there that had a clear view of it. And as he passed that, he said to, he said to himself, the poor dumb cop or the poor damn cop, the driver wasn't sure what he said. <laughs> but that told me that Oswald had no intention of shooting that officer. It, it, he just didn't know what, if he'd just been using his head a little bit and gave Tippett his identification and everything, Tippett would have looked at it and passed him on. With, uh, but, he, but Oswald wasn't thinking fast enough to do that. And uh, that, that's that, that's what happened there. And then uh, he went on up, took off, and as he's running across the, the uh, parking area there, lot and didn't have any cars on it to speak of, and there was a huge car lot down on the corner uh, of that block and that man that owned it and his lieutenant had worked in there. They run out and they saw Oswald with the pistol still in his hand and running across there and he had a tan jacket on and he was smart enough to know that the if he got described, they described that he was wearing a tan jacket. So he took that jacket off and tried to throw it underneath the car as he went by. And of course, with their information, we recovered the jacket. And then Marina later identified the jacket as his. <laughs> so uh, then he went on and went up Jefferson Street. And I guess he saw two police cars coming. And he turned into a shoe store and uh, pretended to be looking at shoes. Except the shoe store owner didn't have any customers. And he's standing in the back of the store listening to the all this going on on the radio because every radio and every TV was covered with it and he saw Oswald come in and pretend to be looking at shoes but he's he looking over his left shoulder and these two police cars went by and then he walked out to the sidewalk area and looked both ways and headed west again so that made him suspicious and he followed him and when he got up to the Texas theater instead of buying a ticket he just darted in the door went in and sat down so the shoe store man he uh, uh, told the ticket seller there he said I think the man that shot the officer just went in here said you ought to call the police so they called him and the rest is history because they swarmed on there and arrested him and he fought tried to fight with them but they overpowered him brought him in so he was brought in uh, as a suspect in the killing of uh, Tippett he wasn't brought in for the president deal yet. and uh, consequently when I got to come in and was assigned to him or, well I actually went out to where Tippett was shot and then tried to go to the theater but the traffic was such I couldn't get there and I uh, called the dispatcher and told him to tell him to take him to my office and I'd meet him there so but they were driving a marked car and I was driving a plane car and they got there ahead of me. When I got in, he was sitting in an interrogation room by himself. So I walked in and sat down and started talking to him. And uh, about Tippett, I didn't mention the president because I had no idea he was going to be a suspect in that too. And I had him some 10 or 15 minutes, maybe 20 at the most, before Captain Fritz came back from the school book depository where he was. Uh, he and the, the other officers had been searching. Of course, when they went into the, uh, the school book depository, or they went in expecting to find a stranger. They weren't looking for an employee. But when they didn't find no stranger, then he asked the Mr. T tr truly the manager to do a head count. Well, Oswald was the only one missing, and he kept said, I want to talk to that man. Give me his address. So they gave him his address and everything, but he had given them a phony address. He didn't live there. So the cap come in in a flurry and was gathering up people to go send different directions to look for him from the best information he could gather. Somebody in the office there said, the captain, the man Lavelle's talking to you got a name similar to that because he had told him he wanted to look for somebody named Oswald. And that shows you how closely they was playing to attention to the prisoners that brought in. And so Cap come to the door and opened it and asked me what his name was. And I told him, and then he asked the officer, where do you work? He said, at the school book depository. The captain says, you're the man I want. So I lost my prisoner. The captain took, took over, and I never questioned him any further. But I already had pretty good information from him as it was to help me. But he was assigned to me as my prisoner. Therefore, everything that took place went through me. And when he was when we was transferring him, it was still my since he was my prisoner. It was up to me to head up the movie, and that's what what I did. That's how I come out of being handcuffed. That was one question that's been asked quite a bit. Why was I handcuffed? Right? But he was he was my prisoner. He was assigned to me. Yeah, as we got walked into the basement down there, 
uh, on the transfer, uh, I saw Ruby. He was facing me uh, about five or six feet away. And uh, I saw, I, I, I always make it a habit when I go into a room where there's a uh, where I'm doing an investigation, I always look up and down the people that I see. And I saw Jack Ruby, he was standing right there in front, and he had a pistol in his left hand, holding it against his left leg right tight. And of course, I knew immediately what was gonna happen when I saw that. None of the police officers filled in that area or the newspaper people saw that pistol in his hand. Of course, I give them a bad time later on, all of them, I said, if y'all had been looking up sharp enough you'd look and saw him with that pistol you could have rattled him down there and you could have been heroes but if it is you left it for me to be uh, to confront him so uh, I, I, I just as I, as I walked in and he made two quick steps brought, which brought him into arm's length to me and I reached over uh, past Oswald caught him over the uh, left shoulder and was pushing back, but he had switched the pistol over to his right hand and, and shot. Of course, I, I jerked Oswald back, trying to pull him behind me, so as a rook, when I, when I jerked back on him, I turned his body. Instead of the bit, bullet hitting him dead center, it hit him about four inches to the left of the navel on the left side, and it went through the uh, stomach, and uh, uh, it cut the vena cava in the back, and went over the, through the left, to the right side, hit the, the liver took a chunk out of that and then cut the, one of the main arteries over on the right side and hit the end of the seventh rib and shattered it and glanced off and landed about three or four inches to the right, almost even with where it went in on the, on the right side. Uh, in fact, if it hadn't been for that rib catching that bullet, it, it, if it had missed it, it'd come on and hit me in the side over here. But it hit that rib and bounced off. And when I examined him later on, I could uh, roll that bullet around underneath the skin just like that with my thumb and finger. So when I got him to the hospital, we, we called an ambulance right away and there happened to be one that was returning to their office from a call and they and they accepted the, the uh, call and come by five so we they were there very shortly. Uh, when I got him to the hospital out there and rolled him into the operating room, the doctors was already there ready to go and uh, I told him I said before you do anything else I want that bullet out of him. So they and I showed them where it was and they just pinched it up and hit it with a scalpel and it popped out into a tray that a nurse was holding. I wiped it off with some uh, Kleenex or something and, and took my pocket knife and uh, had a sharp knife point on it and I gave it to the nurse who was holding the tray and I told her I said I want you to scratch your initial on the butt end of this bullet because you and I somewhere down the line is going to be testifying that this is a bullet come out of the hospital and she did that and uh, I testified two or three times. I know she did once, but I testified two or three different times when they was having uh, hearings on, on Ruby. I, I then returned to the office and uh, made, made up the case report for filing on, on him for the murder. Of course, I did, uh, what I did was just file a bill for the grand jury to look at because he, he did, so you can't do anything with it. But, I felt like uh, they needed to hear it, so they did uh, indict Ruby for murder, and we tried him the following year and got the death penalty on him, but the uh, Court of Criminal Appeals uh, overturned it and sent it back for a retrial. Uh, it seems like that the judge that was hearing the case was writing a book about that trial, and they were afraid that he, you know, he would use uh, some, uh, some decision, make some decision in the favor of his book rather than the prisoner. I don't know that he would do it, but the obvious would be there. It, it might, might, might be what happened. So they overturned it, and I think it's a pro proper thing to do, uh, but they did. And we reset him for trial in uh, February the 10th, uh, 1967, and uh, he died on, on January the 4th or 5th of 1967 from cancer. He developed on a jail.